Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kirsten Howard. I'm a coastal resilience specialist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Coastal Program. Um, I'll also mention that our program administrator, Steve Kutcher, is here as well, just to kind of listen and get a make sure we're we're sort of hearing all of the issues that. Um, that folks are having that you guys want to discuss today. But the reason I came, Bob in invited us to come and speak a little bit about um, some of the issues that came up in the last meeting, and I know you guys have been discussing for a long time. Um, I thought I would start by just giving you a quick idea of what the coastal program within DES does. Um, uh, so typically, we, we're housed within the water division of, of DES, which some of you may be familiar with from the, the Wetlands Bureau side of things. We're separate from them. Um, we uh, typically were funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, by NOAA. Um, and so we're given pass-through funds from NOAA to uh, fund a, a small staff within DES and also to provide technical assistance to the 17 coastal communities within New Hampshire, including Hampton. Um, so we do that in a number of ways. Um, over the past decade or so, flooding, coastal flooding, coastal hazard issues have become more and more of a priority for our program. Um, uh, the UNH study that um, one woman mentioned, I, if it's a study that you were referring to, we were involved in helping to get that um, developed and published. Um, we provide uh, staff support um, from the planning kind of side of things and project management. Um, we provide, in some cases, um, when the federal budget allows it, um, pass through grants to communities um, uh, to do different projects on kind of a competitive basis. And then we also fund uh, planning assistance on a pretty regular basis for the Rocking and Planning Commission, which provides some support to Hampton as well, specifically to focus on coastal management issues. So um, I'm not an engineer and I'm not a permitter, um, but I um, what I did uh, after kind of reading the minutes from your last meeting and um, thinking about it a little bit was reached out to a number of, of folks within DES, uh, within the Rocking and Planning Commission, um, and within other state agencies to get put some resources together to try and, and start to answer some of the questions that are coming up and help folks move forward. So um, first I'll mention everybody said it was fantastic to see the four issues that were, were listed really clearly articulated. That's really helpful for us in moving forward to think about whether we can um, provide any technical assistance on any one of those four points. Um, I think it was uh, uh, the parking, the uh, emergency alerts, the um, the engineering assistance, and then specifically help with permitting. Um, so I'm sure there's broader issues associated and obviously more localized issues when it comes to specific areas in town that are, are flooding, um, points of, of flooding concern and drainage concern. But um, uh, I, guess, I guess what I'll mention is I, I put together a, a few resources, probably not, not enough handouts for everybody, um, but I can also send them electronically to, to Bob um, uh, to sort of help you understand what contacts are available within, within uh, different agencies that might be able to help with different pieces of that. Um, now, it's, if it's helpful for you, I can go through some of those now, um, uh, but I don't want to, I want to use the time uh, in the best way possible. So. Um, if it's helpful for you, I can give you an overview of the funding that I know is out there, in addition to kind of the town level, um, the funding that may be available in the future um, to deal with some of these issues, um, and also just the contacts that might be worth reaching out to under different situations. Um, I'll, I'll just mention one thing that's super relevant to your last discussion um, that, uh, that might be helpful for the emergency alert piece, and folks may be aware of this um, at this stage in, ta in time um, is that uh, in 2013, a tide gauge was installed in Hampton. Folks might be aware of that. Um, it had some issues in the last year or so that have been fixed. It's managed by um, a partnership um, with NIRACUS, which is a, an ocean um, observing system organization within the state. Um, they work with the National Weather Service, and there's a website on this page that I printed out for folks that um, basically gives you real-time tide-level data um, 
for um, and then and then determine sort of the alert level as it relates to flooding. Um, and there is a forecast um, RSS feed associated with that that you could potentially incorporate into existing emergency alert systems within town. So I gave you both the links to that. You might know about it already, but if you don't, then um, then now now you do. Um, so um, that might be one feature that helps you with that second item on the list. Um, do you want me to continue at this point and just give kind of an overview of the state programs that that come up? I think so, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so, um, so as I mentioned, the coastal program has some assistance available sometimes. We don't have a com any competitive grant programs out right now. Last year, we did offer a coastal resilience grant opportunity that would potentially, um, if you were looking to do an engineering study about what's feasible related to r raising roads, for example, then the town might be able to assist with that. Um, then again, sometimes it's a lot faster if you're able to go through the town process and get a warrant article. As the selectman said earlier, that might be your easiest approach. So um, just so you know, we'll keep this issue in mind, and if future opportunities come up for that, um, that may be an option. The Rocking and Planning Commission, who I know you reached out to already, um, I spoke with them, and they said they're happy to come to any future meetings you guys have to talk a little more. We, as I mentioned, fund them to provide technical assistance to communities focused on coastal issues. So they have a grant right now where they might be able to provide a little bit of staff support to at least help move the process forward from a planning perspective, but they don't offer engineering services. If you wanted engineering uh, services associated with the Rocking and Planning Commission work, it would have to be sort of a larger grant and they would hire a contractor. Um, so again, it might be faster to go through town processes or, you know, depends, depends what the priority is for the group. Um, is there federal, is there a way for you to go for federal for us or something? For engineering specifically? And to get the work done. Yeah, and okay. Army Corps or engineers or something. So I can get into the federal stuff. Um, so typically the programs that come to mind for federal funding have to do with FEMA. Um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They run the National Flood Insurance Program, which some of you may be quite familiar with. Um, they also have hazard mitigation programs. And so the pamphlet that I put over there lays out pretty clearly, there are only 20 of them, but I, again, I can send you the electronic version, um, the three different funding programs that FEMA provides um, for raising homes, for doing more uh, culvert uh, replacements or enlargements. Um, there is, uh, there are some stipulations associated with each of those grant programs, and they typically come through the state. So, the uh, Department of Homeland Sec and Secur Homeland Security and Emergency Management um, usually collects the FEMA money and then distributes it to towns. So, um, currently, Whitney Welsh um, and Jennifer Gilbert are probably your contacts you would want to reach out to associated with FEMA funding. I've listed their contact information on this sheet as well. Jennifer uh, runs the state, uh, is sort of the state contact for the flood insurance program. Whitney is our state um, hazard mitigation officer. So um, some of you might remember one of the bigger snowstorms okay. that happened in the spring that was declared a federal uh, a presidential disaster. And as a result of that, um, some money was given by FEMA to the state, and they do currently have a funding opportunity open. They're requesting letters of intent by August 1st. Um, and the letter of intent has to come from the town, so you have to get your board of, of selectmen probably to, to submit that. I think they have a fairly minimal amount of money. I'm not sure what it is, but Whitney is happy to talk to you more about it. Um, there is a match associated with all of those grants. I think it's 25%. Um, and that money, that pamphlet lays out really clearly what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. So um, that's the first program listed on that pamphlet. Um, in addition to that, the other two programs are funded based on the federal budget, and at the moment um, there isn't really funding available for that. Um, but if there is, uh, Whitney and Jennifer and I could certainly um, make folks aware of that. Um, one of those programs is specifically related to um, private homes, and um, there are some stipulations around those programs um, as funding becomes available about um, you're, you know, you're only eligible for, for some of that funding if you have flood insurance, um, uh, for example. But um, they're all different, so that pamphlet's great for, for those purposes. Oh, what did you just say about flood insurance? 
uh, one of the grant programs requires that you have flood insurance on your home before you can be eligible for the money. Um, but then the money would be able to be used to Enhance raise a home, home or mitigate oh, really? in some okay. way. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm not aware that funding is available in that program at the moment, but it comes up in the next uh, budget perhaps. Yeah. Um, so that's the extent of the federal funding that I'm aware of. Um, occasionally the coastal program is able to apply for uh, other grants through NOAA, um, and we come up with proposals associated with them. Um, so if that were to come up, um, there's likely to be one in the fall, but again, federal budget dependent, so um, we're still kind of waiting to see um, what that funding will look like. Um, and there could be potential to do some planning, um, some uh, engineering design, that type of thing within that. I will say that Coastal Program's funding sources are not eligible to be used on private property, um, so that is definitely a limitation with the NOAA money um, for construction. So, but, but design, planning, those sorts of things, we've done a lot of. Well, could that money that you're speaking of NOAA be used to like raise roads or put in it, fill for the street? Um, so we, we haven't done that yet. Um, with with NOAA money, um, but um, I, can't, I won't say no. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. It would probably be a case by case basis depending on where it is. I will say the other person I talked to is Evan Lewis, who is with our Wetlands Bureau. He does a lot. He's now is does the permitting out here um, for the Wetlands Bureau for um, dredge and fill and for shoreland. Um, so he's also happy to chat with anyone if they have something they want to do to their house um, or. Or if you're talking about road raising, um, he would definitely be someone to talk to about the permitting requirements. Many of you are probably more familiar with those than I am, but he did want me to bring up the fact that it is you do have beautiful wetlands in the area. They certainly are providing you a lot of flood mitigation benefits. They're they're attenuating the storm surge in those big storms, and they're they're keeping um, keeping the water out, but only to a certain extent. And they are prime prime wetlands, so that means that any permit through the Wetlands Bureau would be a major impact project. From like what you're saying, I think that's why we're all here, because if, if I did something to my property, say, and spent money, it's not going to do any good. The, the roads have to be raised. Right. Somebody it's, has to come in and say, yeah. the roads have to be raised or drudged or whatever, and then you move forward and do what they say to do. You know what I'm saying? Right. But for me to do anything to my property would be a waste of money and time, because my road's flooding. Yeah, so so obviously it is a, it, it is a group kind of issue. It's, yes. a, it's a community issue when, you, when you're talking about the road has to meet your driveway. And, right. Um, so, so the Rocking and Planning Commission um, might be worth talking to um, about uh, being able to kind of come up, come up with um, some quick options that have been sort of applied in other communities that are comparable to Hampton. They may, so, so I'd definitely say talk to Julie if you're interested in that approach and also kind of laying out what the, what the steps are within New Hampshire um, planning and permitting within that realm to, um, to help folks get a better sense of how to move forward on this. And, um, Can you give us any examples of what other communities in New Hampshire have done to address this issue both short term and long term? Yeah, um, so so Hampton and Seabrook certainly are the most at risk of, of tidal flooding within within our coastal area. Um, so you guys are to some extent on the cusp of, of being having to be innovative, unfortunately, about um, these types of issues within New Hampshire. There are pl there are more examples, I would say, in Massachusetts that might be applied. Um, Portsmouth, for example, has in installed one-way flaps on a lot of their drainage um, so that um, the stormwater will go out, but the tide won't come in. Um, we've been looking a lot at, at culvert sizing. Um, it's a tough issue with, with property, you know, with the butters, but um, to some, in some cases, um, expanding culverts might make sense, although um, in a lot of those communities, they have a little more flood. They have a little more relief in, um, in the floodplain just because they're at a slightly higher elevation. Um, I will say that I also brought a copy of the Coastal Risk and Hazards Commission report, which you guys can have um, if you want. And I also brought some one-pagers that have the link to it over there, so you can take a look at that. That has a lot of recommendations within it that are specific to New Hampshire, um, focused on, on flooding in the coast. Um, uh, it also lays out the sea level rise scenarios that, um, that the commission agreed upon with its science panel and 
Um, so, so that's just, as some of you are probably aware of those as well, but it's uh, part of why you may be seeing more flooding now is, is because that's starting to happen and um, it's not going to get better based on um, best available science. So that's a reality that planning now makes a lot of sense um, uh, for that. Um, the other piece I wanted to mention actually is um, the legislature just passed a bill at SB 185 um, and it passed it on July 6th. It came out of the Coastal Risk and Hazards Commission process. Um, it, it will become effective in September and um, it's an act extending the community tax relief to coastal properties subject to storm surge, sea level rise, and extreme precipitation. Um, some, of, um, some of you may have followed that, that bill. Um, it, I've only really just read it closely in the last couple of weeks, um, so I can't really offer much analysis on it, but it does enable the town to uh, create what's called a coastal resilience incentive zone um, that would then uh, provide, could provide tax relief to homeowners that do mitigate in some way um, and also enables the town to set up a coastal resilience incentive zone uh, fund that would um, be uh, non-expiring that could assist properties with, with these mitigation efforts. So, I mean, whether that's helpful or not, it's just something to be aware of. Kristen, I have a question. Yeah. Um, if you had a home on one of these streets and your car was being flooded and everything was happening, what would be what would you do right now? What would be your uh, steps that you would take? Um, yeah, I'm I'm definitely sympathetic to the extent and seriousness of the issues that are happening. I've been down here on a spring tide and seen how the garbage cans are floating around on the streets. And I think a woman um, men, a woman who had rented a, 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 an apartment and hadn't lived here before stuck her head out the window and said, did you know this was going to happen? I didn't move my car. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's obviously very clearly a very serious issue that's happening now. Um, if I had a home here, I think I would probably be at this meeting with all of you um, and a little bit worried. <laughs> well, considering your experience in this area, I'm yeah. just wondering, where would you go? What would your... Um, so I would, say, I would say to the extent that flood insurance is an option for you, make sure you have it. Um, I, I know have a question for the people. Do you have... Is there anybody that doesn't have flood? Can you get flood? No, $14,000 a year on my flood. Yeah. Just, I'm just going to answer that that's not a question that I think I'm fully capable of answering now, but I'm happy to provide you with some resources about um, what I think are some some options. I mean, it, it's it's a, an issue that I think will continue to need to be discussed, and there are options out there, but I, I can't fully put myself in, in your shoes. Are you? My question is, and I appreciate your question, we are the residents that live on the yeah. street. The page that I put together is is the best set of resources that um, that I have. Natalie, if you wouldn't mind passing that out um, to again only twenty copies, but I'll send an electronic version. Um, I do think um, right now your best option for funding is a warrant article within Hampton and going to the select board. I think that advice from the last 
and obviously that impact has been made. She was here, so um, that's a good start. Um, I'll also say that um, uh, the flood mitigation program funding that's available now is probably one other option I know of that would get funding here soon. Um, in addition to that, um, the folks listed there and my program will be available to continue participating in the discussion and trying to direct you to the best people. So our next, forward. one of the calls that we're waiting on is from the DPW director, Chris Jacobs. For Hampton. For Hampton. Do you want to be involved in these meetings going forward? Do you want us to keep you or someone from your program involved? I think to the extent that um, that you're comfortable having us involved, we're, we're learning to some extent along with you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. We appreciate that. Okay. So I do have a question about, and that it's sort of, I guess it's sort of maybe a select moment. Um, March is a long way off, and it may fail in March, and it may not pass, and then we would have laid all of our eggs in that one basket. Yeah. So okay. what can we do um, setting that warrant aside? You know, what can we do to be more proactive to get things moving? And I agree it is going to be a process, yeah. but there's a lot of risk with that particular path. So what other path do you think we should <laughs> focus on yeah so um, I think the flood mitigation program that's that's uh, the hazard mitigation program funding that's available now if folks can get get a letter of intent submitted by August 1st that's really um, that's really probably um, the fastest way to, to get money and is that um, individually or is that collectively the town submits a proposal um, so it could be an individual it could be a group um, that is behind that proposal, but the town has to submit it. Um, I have one thing to say. It's the people who own and live in the around that have got to do it. Because even though I own, I'm not allowed to vote on anything, precinct or local. But I own property and I'm in a position that you can't do anything. You, um, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just one of those things. One of the issues that I've seen is when you fix one problem, you create a problem somewhere else because water has got to go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, they build new condos, they raise the land, it looks beautiful, they don't have any water issues, but their neighbors have water issues, which is, is your neighbors. Yeah. Right. And uh, they have they put the gate up down by Brown and, um, and uh, Church Street to, yeah. to, to stop the water from flooding that area. Well, that water's got to go somewhere. So is, is, I, I think we're... These little things that you're talking about are great to start with, but we need something major to, whether it's a levy, I, you know, I don't know what can be done nowadays. I know that the Environmental Protection Agency make it very hard to do a lot of the stuff. Um, I don't know what can be done, but it's, it's, the little things will be great in the beginning, but I think we really need to go for a, so, huge. Shark, if I can just update the board, really. speaking with Chris Jacobs this week, he is pulling the plans for the Brown app area as well as all the streets west of the police station and then he'll be back in contact so that we can set up a meeting to start to talk about what can be done and also possibly the warrant article for March but understanding what Frank is saying you're right we can't put all our eggs in one basket mm -hmm. so reaching back out to your group I think would also be helpful and then um, even if we have to go down different avenues and start yeah. planning yeah, I mean, taking advantage of every avenue there is is probably one of them will will hopefully um, work out. Um, uh, I will say there are some folks within more outreach-oriented groups that um, that are interested in kind of pr promoting this issue and making it more of a priority within the, the different bodies within the state agencies within the legislature, and so. Um, so the New Hampshire Coastal Adaptation Work Group is is one website that I link to. It might be they would be interested in um, discussions or workshops. Um, uh, we have in the past uh, been to workshops where we've we've listened to folks planning in communities in the Miami area or in North Carolina or in um, uh, areas that were affected by by Superstorm Sandy and and listening to how they. Um, have dealt with some of their flooding issues and rebuilt in a different way, and so um, that could be a potential option. 
Um, but again, like you said, I, I think it will be a, it will be a process. Um, the the other piece that I think is really helpful for my program, um, if if you do want us to assist you, um, is the more developed a proposal you can kind of put together around those those four priorities or whatever they may be. Um, the easier it is for us to sort of make the case when funding becomes available. Um, so, you know, if you if folks can flesh out what exactly those engineering services need to look like um, and where, um, and what specific kind of permitting questions you think would need to be addressed in, in permitting technical assistance, that would be really helpful for us. We can help help with that to some extent, but it kind of has to come Kristen. from you guys. Are you familiar with the study at UNH about the effects of, on groundwater of sea level rise? Yes. Can you address that a little bit? Sure. Um, actually, so my, uh, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, uh, Jennifer Jacobs and Jane Knott um, at UNH have been working with a group called the Infrastructure and Climate uh, Network for Transportation Issues or something like that. Um, they, um, one of the issues associated with, with sea level rise is not just that you'll see higher high tides, it's that the groundwater table is going to get pushed um, inland and up um, along with that kind of that seawater moving, um, moving inland. So um, they're doing a study to basically understand under different sea level rise scenarios where that new groundwater table will be. Um, uh, it can help inform work around saltwater intrusion in your water so drinking water sources, um, and also uh, infrastructure and and ecosystems that would be affected by higher groundwater. There are certain communities in the coast that are more affected by groundwater rise than sea level rise, um, uh, and so so Portsmouth, for example, has a really high groundwater table to begin with, and so they're actually going to see a lot of impacts from groundwater rise depending on the sea level rise scenario um, uh, compared to some of the other communities further south. My program is actually working right now to get a grant to make that data more publicly available on maps. So um, I'm not sure if you, if you did work with Jennifer or in, were involved in any of the discussions um, as they developed that data or if you just saw it in the news. But. No, I, I'm not on that. We've had okay. connection with her over the community rating system. Oh, yeah which is a work in progress. So that's Jennifer Gilbert, I, be I believe. Yeah. Yep. Two Jennifers. Yep. There are, I think they've both been here. There are lots of Kristens and Kirstens, too. So I'm Kirsten. And I'm sorry I put it no, in. No, that's thing. okay. Weren't you an American girl doll at some point? Yeah. <laughs> that's true. I have a question. Have you gone before the selectmen yet? Have um, you made an appointment to do so? We have not. We were, um, Fred Welch did call me on June 30th asked me um, to hold off going before the selectmen until we could meet with Chris Jacobs, Chris being an engineer, and having three additional engineers in the DPW group. Um, I was just thinking about that letter of interest by August yeah. 1st. Perhaps that might be something that Chris Jacobs could have a hand in while you, because right. you don't have a lot of time, it seems to me. Right. You know? So do you know if there's a format to do the LOI? Yes, I included the link on this handout, and it's actually, a, I looked at it, it's a pretty simple form. Okay. Um, I, I, I'll send the electronic version, and then you can just click right to it because okay. it's kind of a long link. Yeah, that would be helpful. I know that. That's what I wanted to do. Certain format, yes. certain information. That we yeah, need. I think you attach a letter, but you have to fill out the form. And I, I'm going to tell you, we've worked with uh, Chris and Jennifer on different things, and they're mm -hmm. they're super. Awesome. They really are. So you'll, they're very professional, and they know their stuff. So right. it's good. Will... Hampton's very lucky to have them. I can't speak for the group, but I'm going to um, assume that we probably want to do the letter of the transfer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my husband and I are residents down on Bragg Avenue. We have very similar issues down there. But I'm thinking, uh, obviously, most of you seem to be from the Brown a Avenue area. You have uh, no, from, from all different area. places. Do we have a list that, yes. that we could uh, put our names yeah. on to before you leave tonight? Question. So all these grants that we're talking about, free money, um, are they matching? Are they most of them matching? Or uh, it depends. The um, the 
one that you would submit a letter of intent for would be um, a match of 25%. The so, reason I say that is because any kind of town, town's concerned about two things. Yeah. They're concerned about tourists, they're concerned about schools. So a lot of these are vacation homes. They don't care about vacation homes. A lot of people own two homes. Guess what? They don't care about us at all. And stuff. A lot of us aren't voting. And so anytime the town's going to have to come with 25% when they vote on it, yeah. they're probably going to say no. So I think we're coming on in there and they kind of money for that. You know I mean? It's going to be real hard to get people, unless you can use that salt water thing or something that's going to affect them. Um, it's going to be real hard to get the towns to match money. To, you know I mean? If you're talking $10 million and the government's going to give $7.5 million, the town's not going to do $2.5 million unless it falls school. Now, if the boardwalk is flooding, that'd be a whole different story. We'd, be, we'd have hundreds of people in here. We'd have things done so quickly. You, would, you know what I mean? Well, that, that, yeah, you say that, but there, most of the people on the boardwalk do not vote on the beach or, or in the town. They're not from... I wouldn't care. But, but the town of Hampton understands that more than, more than a third of their tax base comes from Hampton Beach. So... Um, but definitely. So I think they're going to get that anyway. I think they're going to. They're going to well, not, not, not if you, not if your houses won't sell yeah. because they're yeah. underwater. On like on my street alone, like there's 15 homes, a lot of tax revenue. Nobody goes to school. Even if they do, who cares? But that marsh was put there to collect tax dollars. Now we have a problem with the flooding. It's 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 man-made. There's a flooding problem. I can't fix it. I need to fix it. I live there. But I, I'm going to tell you, okay. I've been on the beach a long time. Probably a lot of you maybe longer but uh, we have the best select board that really works with the beach we when we need things done they, they, they work with us so I think this is the time to get things done to move um, if you've been here a long time you've seen some really tough boards to deal with and uh, not just one or two select men but um, five that were tough well we also have Senator Ennis that's on our side I spoke with him this evening and he apologizes for not being here he's been but he's very, very um, supportive to our cause. And I spoke with Nancy Stiles last week as well, and I'm waiting to uh, meet with her. I've also spoke with Commissioner Rose at Dread, and he's very supportive. So I think the support is there. We just need to figure out how to group and then drive this. And the governor is from the seacoast, so I mean, that's another question. I will admit that they are doing better making sure because way back they came in low. They should have come in higher, and whatever happened, now they make them come in at the height they were supposed to. Because when they did re Brown Avenue to bring it around, all the manhole covers were put in. And all of a sudden, they had to cut them down because they were three feet higher than the road. So they cut them down in order to put the road in. That's part of and like, there's really no solution that, for us. That is no? one of the problems. Yeah, it is. Because we agree. were. I'd like to talk to your comment a little bit, if I could. This is the old adage, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The things you're addressing are in the immediate future, and there's no quick fix. No. But you've got to stay the course, or there'll be no fix. Well, they are doing things. What, uh, what they're about to have to do is going to be a very expensive doing. And there's a lot of data out there that would be powerful arguments, if used, to get the town to do it. When the uh, Rockingham Planning Commission did the assessment of sea level rise, they basically divided into three levels of flooding, 1.74 feet and 6.3 feet. And they, and they do it by sea level rise alone or in conjunction with storm surge. Then they made an assessment of the aggregate value of the affected parcels. And this is where the, your argument should go, should go, I think. At 1.7 feet, 1,149 parcels are, are aggregately affected. At 6.3 feet, with storm surge, 3,065 properties are adversely affected. It ranges in the value of the aggregate properties from four hundred and fourteen million dollars to one billion one point eight hundred and eighty-eight million dollars. What's even more interesting in this is at four feet with storm surge, the aggregate property assessed value affected is nearly the same as it is at six feet. What am I saying? I am saying the town may not be able to survive as a town if this 
amount per hertz were to occur. A second argument you might want to get into is the Sea Level Rise Commission, the state forum, came up with a couple of interesting figures about the 17 towns that Kristen referred to. It said the population of those towns is 11% of the state. The gross domestic product of those towns is 25% of the state. You also have the state heavily invested on Ocean Boulevard. The state has an enormous dog in this fight. What you're going to have to do is work toward the theme that everybody in this town is as affected as you are, only differently. And you'll reach them only when you're convinced to not do it is going to be more expensive to them individually than to do it. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of effort. But I think it can be done. You people are the engine driving this, and they will, they will not ignore the large group. But you're going to have to sell it at the, uh, a couple of other things I would mention. Stephen is the chairman of the budget committee. If you are interested in the fall when the budget committee starts meeting, those meetings are live televised. When the DPW director goes before the budget committee and presents his Warren articles and his uh, line item budget, look to see if there's money proposed for these issues to be addressed at all in the terms of engineering studies at this point particularly. Uh, you also should take into consideration the amount of taxes that the people in this room pay regardless of whether you leave her or not. And you need to probably tally that up and bring that with you. There's a lot of taxes in this room. That's what my question is. Isn't the village paying more taxes than other sections of Hampton? So why shouldn't we get our money's worth in regards to that? Well, the village district taxes go toward, uh, the, the, it, it goes to the uh, the entertainment and the advertising for the village district. So that that's, that's separate. For people that own homes, I think that's, we have to deal with that situation before you deal with any kind of anything else. You're bringing in money for the recreation and, and stuff like that, and that's fine, but what, where's that money going to? I'm a little confused with that. I think, I, am too. That you, I think she's saying that you have to take care of the homeowners that are paying the taxes to fund all this stuff and to enjoy the beach instead of bringing it for it. And that's great, but you got to take care of the homeowners. Because if they're not, if the homes are not good or proper, right. then you're not going to get these people to rent anymore. Oh, yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. Well, then that also impacts the MNR tax state, right? Right. Because that's rental property, so then that also goes yeah. back to the state yeah. Could I speak? Uh, somebody in this group last, when we had our last meeting, mentioned that um, in Salisbury, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. the um, Corps of Engineers, Army Corps of Engineers, um, built a wall, and it was there was a lot of federal money used. Um, and I think that somebody in this group, maybe the group leader, should contact the uh, selectmen or mayor or whatever they have in Salisbury and ask them how did you do this and also what did it cost? Some round number because they, are you familiar with what they did in Salisbury? To, to some extent and actually Julie LeBranch is pretty familiar with that project at the Rocking and Planning Commission. She, she said she'd be happy to share some information about because, it as well. That said, I think that that's, it's gonna, as far as starting at the village district and then the town, you're talking a big, big project here, and I think we're talking federal government assistance, not trying to get it out of every taxpayer that lives here in this, at the beach. It's got to come from higher up, Donald Trump. So, I Sorry. actually, well, I actually yeah. know about this. Well, they, they, they had a meeting this time month of Massachusetts, and I mean, I met with um, Fred Walsh down in the town meeting. They had a meeting from Wealth of Mass and U.S. Army Engineer Corps, and they get funded, they got 70%, and the taxpayers only had to pay 30%. Yeah, so, and it was um, because of the Massachusetts, and they had to be, this didn't take a long, I mean, this took almost 11 years. Yeah. 
Yes, but it's, so, but they I mean, fit. They got to work. If we do have like a warrant article for the engineers, what I was told that even if we do get a warrant article and it's put on the, we then they can get the engineers. They can do the study. But then we have to have another warrant article to get the funds. Oh so yes, we can go and that's. That. But but I think that what I'm saying is that. <laughs> As all of you that aren't from New Hampshire that come here for the summer and pay big taxes on your properties, the way New Hampshire is set up with no sales tax, no uh, income tax, so that all the money go, comes out of the pockets of the people that own land, and it's it's difficult. It's difficult. You can't keep going to them and saying we're gonna we're gonna double your taxes on your house because we need all this money to build a, whatever you need to build. I think that the federal government has to step in. And perhaps you should be contacting Gene Shaheen and, uh, and Kelly. Uh, oh, Hassan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kelly can't help you. Not, not anymore. But, but I, think you should be, I think you should be asking those people to get involved in this because they are um, they your federal representatives from this state. And they're, the government of this country is Serve, this, serve the people as well. And I think a project that big, and I think that that's... I agree. I, it, this isn't just going to be at the top. We're going to need... No, it's got to be... Right. This is a big, big project. But I think that was a 75, 25% somebody talked about. Well... Too. So it's just like, you're talking a lot of money. 25% of a lot of money is a lot of money. Yes. But I'd rather spend 25 to get a tax. Yeah, but you don't vote yet. That's the problem. Well, I pay taxes. That's all they do. You don't vote. Uh, well, the, 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 the truth is... The truth is that before I moved to Hampton, I also, I lived at a lake where there were a lot of people that were um, from out of town, out of state. And the way it works is that for you people that don't vote, Thank you. the selectmen in this town represent you, okay? And that's the way it works. So make your, make your case known to the selectmen. They speak for you. Okay. We can't get to the selection just yet. We're trying you're to working on it. I know. Right, you're working. working on it. But that's, you know, this is a big, big, big project. It's a big picture. It may take 11 years, 12 years to get it done but, right. But you're right. Town, state, and then if we do, we can contact the feds. Got to. Got to. Bring them in on this as well. And, you know. At the local level, you've got to understand where the points of opportunity to politicize are. In January, the Budget Committee has an open hearing for all money articles in the budget. You don't have to vote in the town to go and express an opinion. In February, the town has something called a deliberative session. And again, you can go to that session and express your opinion about the issues that matter to you. You've got to politicize it or you're not going to get there. And You've got to use arguments that convince the rest of the town that it is as much at risk as you are, which they are. It's not as apparent or present, but it will come. And one thing I would have you consider doing is see if the UNH could do an economic impact study of the outcome of these different variables for assessed value impacts at different levels of sea level rise what that would mean to the community as a whole, whether there'd be a community in the form we now know it. Street, everything. 
and they will not. I went to the town, and they said that um, environmental and want you to do nothing. Conservation. Conservation. Yep. So now is that state or is that local conservation? What is it? Local and state. They told me go to the state, fight with the state. Island path. Julie, we're going to ban you if you keep that phone on. <laughs> and they were supposed to put one of those things that they did on the corner of, um, what's that, uh, High Street and Brown Ave, and they were supposed to put one down on the corner of Island Path, and they never did. And I was told there's a big bowl was stuck in there so the water doesn't go down Island Path any further. And this has been going on, I've been out here for 20 years. I'd like to revisit what you said uh, earlier that you uh, are holding off on seeing the selectmen. Were you told how long you must hold off or how long that will be? <laughs> um, so, to his defense, to the, select, um, to the town manager's defense, he called on June 30th, asked, said that Chris Jacobs would call. It was the 4th of July week. They were pretty busy. I did speak with Chris on Monday. He asked mm -hmm. for a couple of days. I figured I'd give him till Friday. He has my contact information. He just needed time to pull all the flooding reports and charts for our area. And then he's going to set up a meeting for anybody that wants to be involved. Um, Fred Welch, as Mary said, has also, she's met with him. Um, and then we're gonna get together, get all our facts in line, and then we will be scheduled to meet with the select. I know I, I immediately after our meeting last month, I got calls from two of the selectmen, from Regina and from from Rick, and um, they're like, we got to do something to help these people. Yeah. So they're on board. Right. I, I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't seen the others. I'm sure they're the same. I haven't um, met anybody that isn't. Everyone that I have, that I have seen. I'm telling you, we have I've five really select positive. selectmen that are really yeah. pro town, pro beach. They're really, we don't have the butting heads that we've had in the past. And I do understand revenue is revenue. It's true. We bring in a lot of money at the town level, and also we give a lot of money to the state level. And people don't want to that revenue, whether you're in town or state, or I'm sure the feds as well. So it's just figuring out how are we going to start the group, what are we going to do, um, and maybe setting up subcommittees with, you know, so that everyone isn't doing the same amount And I don't know what your schedule is, but I, I, I don't. If you want to head out, we maybe take some last questions, or if you want to hang out, that's fine too. I just don't want to keep you here all night, so. Um, um, I can stay for a little while longer. I might right, sneak so out. Do you have any more questions, questions over down, here? But. I have one. Uh, you started to uh, speak about the um, the wall or guide down in Salisbury. Your friend knows about it. And what do you think? I've been down there to look at it. I was kind of impressed with it because it's, it's not just dealing with one person. I've been down in Manchester. You need people to um, And the problem is, if you just do one house, it's just going to go in the other one's driveway. But what they've done down there was to extend it all in the whole neighborhood. And I was very impressed with it. It's all fiberglass. It's high enough. It's got a rail on the top. And they've got coverts that go out with, with um, the gate valve so the water can't come in, but it can go out. Your, your friend or your cohort? Julie LaBranche, who's uh, she's a senior planner with yeah. the Rockingham Planning Commission, uh, she like that has or? evaluated it. She, she, um, uh, she had a similar reaction to you. She was impressed with the aesthetic. Um, think and thought it um, looked like it was it was well designed she's not an engineer either but I think she'd be happy to, to talk about it a little bit I, I haven't been I to see it. It. one thing I will mention is that Massachusetts I think it was referred to but Massachusetts and New Hampshire wetlands permitting are pretty, are pretty different in this situation and so um, you'd be facing different barriers associated with 
um, with the uh, I think Evan Lewis is probably the right person to talk to a little more about that and they rarely have have permitted walls in, in recent history and, and with the prime wetlands I'm I think that that is a factor um, but again not my area of expertise so I think it's up I think it's up to stop the flooding or basically uh, you know the, the yeah, the beach there. Side. so it's kind of the same thing they don't do anything down on the interest and opposite you know the foundations are going to come down their house in a row so yeah already the, happening John. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it is the, uh, so the rocks are okay but it's all um, again, Evan's probably the right person to chat with about that. It, it, he would say it's it's very much a case by case basis. Typically, within the hierarchy of wetlands permitting, uh, riprap rock is favored over walls. Um, that said, uh, that's outside of a prime wetland area. So, um, as far as, as, far as he's he's in the Portsmouth, Portsmouth office again. His contact information is on that sheet, and he said he'd be happy to chat. I have a general question for the group. There are other people we could invite if you're interested in coming and hearing. This is one of the advantages of having a village district as a governmental entity. People will respond to the invitation. And we're televised. It's not live television, but Channel 2 will carry these meetings, which is another way to get your message out to a broader public. Channel 22. Channel 2 is a more highbrow <laughs> Massachusetts <PBS>. version. <laughs> well, do you think that we could invite Julie LaBranche here next meeting? Sure. And Julie's been here a number of times on yeah. the community rating yeah. issue. <laughs> if she could come in next, our next monthly meeting, which would be the second Wednesday in August, a lot of you would still be here and you could ask her about that project and get some more specifics about the Salisbury thing because that's the thing that seems to be the, the solution of where we should be going. I would say it's point. definitely worth having a conversation with Evan if you want to yeah, head down. Invite Evan, invite Evan as well. Yeah. Yeah. He knows the prime wetland more and yeah. And yeah. the Rockingham Planning Commissioner is just going into office. The executive director now is retiring, so maybe we should invite him along with Julie. Yes. If they're willing to come. We Sorry. usually like to get their response before announcing it. Just a suggestion, I don't know the discussion that I don't want to intervene in whatever direction you want to go, but um, before you start asking people to come in and talk about the solutions, I you really start to understand the problem and the engineering options that you may have before jumping to, we need a wall, we need this. Um, you really don't have all the data for that yet. And it's just, um, anyways, you don't want to waste other people's time to jumping ahead of yourself and investing a lot of time looking at what particular options we need others that are out there that provide a better solution uh, in the long term. So just something to think about. All right. And so Julie did mention she, uh, if you talk with her, she may be able to, within existing resources, um, compile a suite of, uh, a, a set of information that would sort of help to lay out the issue, help you understand what questions you need to ask. Um, it sounds like the DPW is interested from an engineering perspective, but definitely a but good idea to have a conversation with them. Yeah. You know, we, we all have a wealth of information, but we don't know how to compile it and put it in the right terminology. Okay that we're speaking the same language as the engineers, yeah. as wetlands, yeah. as permitting. You know, so, we only know what we know, right. so we need help with that. Yeah. And that was going to be my initial question, was how do we start? Who would be the first loop, or who can assist us with starting to, I think you made a good point about we have four topics that we brought in the June meeting, but how do we articulate those so that we can start to get what we need to get these problems. Yeah. Um, well, our program and the Rocky and Planning Commission are um, the types of programs that help with that kind of translating and that kind of sort of proposal development and um, sort of putting into the right speak, uh, so to speak. So um, I, I can continue to be involved and I'm sure Julie would be willing to help too. Um, I think in addition to those four things you mentioned, Steve's point is really good. There's almost like a bigger question of like, is the flooding issue drainage, mm -hmm. 
and tidal and and kind of and where is it specifically? And there are maps out there that show a lot of that data, but to make sure that this group is on the same page about the fact that you know the issues are our drainage here and tidal here and depends on the on the. Um, We're also not the only group. There's a Green Street group right now that has already been to the selectmen at their previous at their past meeting. So there's a whole nother flooding issue that's being. Um, yeah. I'm not quite clear whether you want us to invite these people in. Not or you yet. Want, not yet? Not okay. Yet, Maybe we'll work on the September meeting. Yeah. And that way let people us, should still be around. You let us know and yeah, we'll go from there. Great. We appreciate that, but I think we need to meet with Chris Jacobs. I think we need to meet with the engineers and see what data is out there. I think we're, we know what we want, but we're not really sure we know what we want. On uh, an optimistic note, a couple of years ago there was a Warren article to do away with commercial rubbish pickup. There was a groundswell of opposition, and that Warren article was defeated by a vote of 83% against, 17% in favor. And the reason it was defeated is we were able to set in motion a series of arguments which show there was an enormous number of people affected. That's what you have here. You've got to convince the people uptown that they have the problem you have, which they do. It's just in a different form. But you've got to sell them to get the Warren articles passed. Good luck. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.